The doors of the train car were thrown all the way open for the first time in many days, the light of day shining upon us like a blessing. Dozens of Jewish people had been crammed into the teeny cattle car as it rattled through the countryside, taking us farther and farther away from our home in Romania. Desperate people pushed their way out. I held tightly to my twin sister's hand as we were shoved onto the platform, not sure whether to be glad for our release or afraid of what was coming. The early morning air was chilly, a cold wind nipping at our bare legs through the thin fabric of our matching burgundy dresses. I could tell at once that it was very early morning. The sun barely made its way above the horizon. Everywhere I looked, there was tall, sharp, barbed wire fences, high guard towers with SS patrols, Schutzwaffel in German, leaned out, aiming their guns at us, guard dogs held by other SS soldiers, pulled against leashes, barking and growling like a rabid dog I had once seen on the farm, their lips foaming, their teeth flashing white and pointy. I could feel my heart pounding. My sister's palm clenched, sweaty and warm, onto my own. My mother and father and our two older sisters, Edith and Elise, were standing right next to us when I heard my mother's loud whisper to my father, Auschwitz, it's Auschwitz. What is this place? It's not Hungary. We are in Germany, came the reply. We had crossed over the border into German territory. In actuality, we were in Poland, where the Germans had taken over Poland. Germany's Poland was where all the concentration camps were. We had not been taken to a Hungarian labor camp to work but to a Nazi concentration camp to die. Before we had time to digest this news, I felt my shoulder being pushed to one side of the platform. Schnell, schnell, quick, quick. SS guards ordered the remaining prisoners from the cattle car out onto the large platform. Miriam pulled, pulled herself closer to me as we were jostled about. The weak daylight was blocked and unblocked as the taller people were first jammed up next to us, then pulled away by the guards to one side of the other. It looked like they were choosing some of us prisoners for one thing and some for another, but what for? That's when the sounds around us began escalating. The Nazi guards grabbed more people, pulling them to the right or to the left on this section platform. Dogs were snarling and barking. The people from the cattle car started to cry, yell, screaming all at once. Everyone was looking for family members as they were torn away from one another. Men were separated from women, children from parents, and mourning erupted into a pure pandemonium. Everything started moving faster and faster around us. It was bedlam. Zwiggel, Zwiggel, twins, twins. Without seconds, within seconds, a guard who had been hurrying by stopped short in front of us. He stared at Miriam and me in our matching clothes. Are they twins? He asked Mama. She hesitated. Is that good? Yes, said the guard. They are twins, replied Mama. Without a word, he grabbed Miriam and me and tore us from Mama. No, Mama, Mama, no. Miriam and I screamed and cried, reaching out for her mother, who in turn was struggling to follow us with her arms outstretched, a guard holding her back. He threw her roughly to the other side of the platform. We shrieked, we cried, we pleaded, our voices lost among the chaos and noise and despair. But no matter how much we cried or how loud we screamed, it did not matter. Because of those matching burgundy dresses, because we were identical twins so easily spotted in the crowd of grimy, exhausted Jewish prisoners, Miriam and I had been chosen. Soon we would come face to face with Joseph Mengele, the Nazi doctor known as the Angel of Death. It was he who was selecting those on the platform who were to live and those who were to die. But we did not know that yet. All we knew was that we were abruptly alone. We were only ten years old, and we never saw Papa, Mama, Edith or Elise again.